Um, so I grew up with computers my entire life at a time when it wasn't really commonplace for people to have computers in the home and started programming at 13 and just kind of kept going and thought the worst thing that could possibly happen to me was I become a software engineer. And then everything that I wanted to do in my career involved software engineering somehow. Like that's the skill that people were really interested in. So I finally gave in and accepted my fate as being a computer programmer. So I always like to jokingly refer to myself as like a relapsed anthropologist because a lot of what, oh thank you, a lot of what I'm interested in with technology is the socio-technical nature of systems. And so for a very long time in my career, I was working in government, I was working at nonprofits, at the UN, on like some of the oldest computer systems in the world, right? And like they were nasty monsters. But what was really interesting about that work to me is that what's hard about modernization isn't just we take old and we replace it with new. Migrations are hard, and they are still hard in that context. But what's hard about modernization is that there's a whole human process that has grown up around this system and integrated with this system. So it's really less about the technology itself and more about that interface between human and machine systems. And that's what I found really exciting. And I ended up writing a book about all the things that I learned my time uh, working on these systems and triaging them and like how to get organizations to actually be successful modernizing systems. And today I work at a company called Rebellion Defense, which is a defense company, it says so on the label, uh, that works a lot in the AIML space. So I'm in a completely different world. I'm not on legacy systems anymore. I'm on new cutting edge systems, whatever cutting edge means these days. And still the work is like very similar because we're dealing with socio-technical systems. And so Somewhere in that transition from modernization to new systems, I started getting very heavily into formal methods. Uh, we are going to talk about formal verification. The reason why, the, the backstory behind the title of my talk is that I think emphasizing verification when we're talking about formal methods kind of sets us up for failure in software. And we really want to think about how we reason about systems and how we communicate about what systems are doing and their behavior. And there's a lot that formal methods can bring to the table in terms of doing that. So who's heard of formal methods? Some hand, I was expecting this conference in particular to have more hands than normal. Uh, for those of you who've never heard of formal methods before, I'm going to give you a quick overview. The formal part in formal verification and formal methods and formal specification is math, right? We're talking about applying the principles of mathematical proofs to software systems and their behavior. So specifically first order logic, Boolean logic. We're creating a set of true false statements and from that we're deducing the behavior or rather the constraints upon a system. And there are a couple different ways we can use specifications that are written in this style. The, the most like, valuable part is just the specification itself. Just having a document that says this is what the system does, this is what it can't do, this is maybe some ideas about how it does it. Um, but once we have that, we can then put it into a computer and do all sorts of model checking and verification. We can say to the computer, hey, I've given you a set of true false statements about this system. I want to assert that this system will never do such thing. And the computer can come back and say, yes, you're right. I can't find a condition in which that would ever be true. Or the computer can come back and say, like, nope, here is the exact scenario of events that would lead that to happen. If you're familiar at all with a language like Prolog, it's a very similar system of programming. It's like logic-based, right? So then the, the last thing that we, we sometimes can do with these specifications that's kind of on more of the edge and is really exciting is something like symbolic execution, where we kind of reverse the process. We take the specification and then we say to the machine, give me something that fits this develop something like this. And so we start to get in kind of a world of fuzzing and property-based testing, and there's some code generation efforts that are essentially about symbolic execution, which is using the same specification to have the computer produce a scenario for you. So formal verification and formal methods are really commonplace in hardware, they're really commonplace in embedded systems, and then you get a world that I live in of web development and it's like gone. No one knows what you're talking about. It's completely absent from the development process whatsoever. 
And so like, why is it so hard to formalize software that we produce for the internet? This has been a question that's been on my mind a lot the last couple years. And so let's start by talking about verifying hardware, right? When we're talking about formal methods, we tend to end up talking about state machines. So we're talking about finite state machines, some variety. And with verification, you're trying to prove that no combination of inputs and states will lead to an illegal state. This is easier in the world of hardware because the types of inputs are finite, and we know what they are, we know where they're coming from, right? And so it's easier to abstract a set of states for a piece of hardware. And then the other advantage we have with hardware is our release cycles are much longer, and they're actually kind of bound by other conditions. So for example, this is my iPhone. This is actually, I think, an iPhone 11, which is now hilariously ancient in the world of iPhones, right? And like I, Apple comes out with a new iPhone every year, and we make fun of them for that, right? We still buy the iPhone, but we make fun of them for that. Like, oh, iPhone like 15, uh, 20, whatever. Like, is it really all that different? But what would our reaction be if, I, if Apple came out with a new iPhone every month? Right? Will we still be laughing or will we be more cynical about it and less likely to invest in Apple products? So in addition to things like supply chain constraints, in the world of hardware, we have a limitation on how often we can update our things. Whereas in the world of software, we take great pride in pushing as many updates a day as possible. And this affects how verification and specification sort of fits into the overall process. Right? So some other differences when we're looking at verifying software. It's, but, in hardware, we kind of have a finite set of inputs. In software, we have almost an infinite set of inputs, right? We have an infinite number, uh, amount of numbers that we could input into the system. We also, if we're talking about like unbound strings, we have an infinite number of combinations of alphanumeric strings, right? And when we're dealing with the, these lower level systems, we have the ability to sort of extract a lot of that away because it's just ones and zeros or it's just voltage and we don't, now, there isn't necessarily any significance to what the actual string is that's coming into the system. We can just look at like any combination of ones and zeros produces an illegal effect. But in software, there's a lot of context around why these things are good or bad as inputs, right? The string hello world is a dramatically different context than the string bobby tables. And we know that. And we know that one of those things is good, is, or neutral, and one of those things is not an ideal input into the system, but how do we define it? Like, how do we define that in a, a formalized manner? We tend to have a lot of, like, official inputs and then unofficial inputs. So an example of official input is just, like, a user interface. Like, we know that's an input. We know that input is coming into the system. But then a lot of these systems run on shared resources. So we may have something that changes the block of memory that our application is running on. Now we have an input, but we didn't know that we didn't think that was an input. We didn't know that was going to happen, right? And so we have a very complex and ambiguous situation that kind of gets very, very uh, messy very quickly. And it makes it really hard to define exactly what is an illegal state in the context of software, right? What makes the Bobby Tables example bad isn't dropping data from a database. If we said we didn't want ever to be able to drop data from a database, there are probably like three use cases off the top of your head you can think where that's the exactly right thing to do and we shouldn't make that behavior illegal. What's wrong about it is the context, like who's doing it, why they're doing it, questions like that. These are very difficult things to specify. Um, this is generally a, a principle with systems. When you have a high level of complexity, you start to get more and more ambiguity around these issues. So has anybody ever used Erlang's verification tool? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't think so, because when I Google it, all of the results are research papers and there are no tutorials. I actually can't figure out where you can download this thing this day. Like, it came out around the uh, early 2000s, and the FTP server, where the paper recommended that you go download it, no longer responds to requests, right? And so like, even in, in, in a community like this where I think there is slightly more discipline around uh, how applications are designed, like, this isn't really a thing that we do in software, right? So web development. 
right? The thing about web development is even when we're not talking about microservices, we're really dealing with systems of systems. Even when we have a monolith, our actual system behavior isn't all entirely in like say, the back end code that runs on the web server, right? Because we have an interface, which is probably written in JavaScript. Uh, we have a container. We might have some problems with the OS that are, are specifically relevant to how we run. Uh, and then we have a dependency tree of any number of packages, libraries, modules that we're also using. So we have a lot of potential states when we factor in all of these moving parts making up what our application is doing. And our requirements, again, are often ambiguous. So when you talk to people who are like super into verification, uh, the thing that they'll usually say is like, well, you know, it's not really about the verification, right? Like it, the verification is half the battle. Just sitting down and trying to write the specification is valuable because you'll find bugs and it'll think differently about the system and you'll go and talk to other people on the engineering team and like you'll build a better system overall and all of this is true. But it's not the complete picture, right? Because when we're using formal verification, we can't verify, we can't specify these systems without simplifying them. They're simply too complex. So we have to make a decision about what parts, what details of the system we're actually gonna put in the specification and why. And so that creates a situation where, first of all, we're vulnerable to like what I refer to as the documentation issue, which is we write down the spec and then we implement the thing and then we immediately change the system because again, this is web development where we like get off on updating that system as often as possible in a single day, right? So we're immediately changing the system and how do we keep the spec up to date with what's actually in production? That's our first problem. The second problem is that the level of expressiveness in our verification languages, which are really try to distill everything down into like true false relationships is different than the level of expressiveness in our programming languages. And the larger that gap is between the different ways that you can do and express certain concepts in programming and the different ways you can do and express them in verification languages, the more subjectivity is in between the let's take this specification and I'll turn it into an implementation. Does this, the actual implementation actually in fact match the spec and how do we know that it actually in fact matches the spec? And so that's our baseline set of problems and then we have problems with actually developing the models themselves for these kind of systems. So I'm gonna go through some really uh, common issues that software engineers have when they try to start verifying systems by writing specifications. This is the first problem. So this is an example model of an online REPL. You go on the, you open up your web browser, you type in some code, it executes the code, it prints the response for you back in your browser, right? What's wrong with this model? Does anybody have a, a guess about what might be problematic about this model? Quinn. The containers reference each other. The containers might reference each other. Potentially, but really the big issue here is that we're looking at what the system looks like and with verification, we don't care what the system looks like, we care about how it behaves, right? And so behavior and appearance, like where everything is uh, configured in relationship to one another, don't necessarily connect very strongly with one another. A system can look like one thing and its behavior can be completely different. And so the first problem that engineers have with trying to model is that they naturally gravitate towards doing like network diagrams and architectural diagrams and like that is their model. And it's like, but that doesn't tell me anything about how the system behaves. That doesn't really suggest anything about how the system behaves. And so I point this out to people and then I usually get a model like this. Same general system, right? What might be problematic about this one? Anyone take a guess? Oh, no one's brave, that's fine, it's all right. So one part of our model is not really that detailed, right? We say, okay, we have a step where we validate our input. That's a pretty bold statement. How are we validating it? What are we doing? What happens when we don't, val like if we fail validation? And then the other set of our model goes into way more detail about what we're doing. So we don't have like an equal level of abstraction across the model. And that may be problematic because we may be, there may be bugs in the place that we have generalized that now we can't see. 
And often what happens it, when people try to model in this way is it creates blind spots because they end up per creating a different level of detail in places where they already know there are problems. Like I already know that there are potential flaws in my system here, so I'm gonna go into a lot of detail here. I don't know anything about how this works, so I'm just gonna create a black box. And what the important lesson here is that there is a relationship between states and the steps that something is taking in a process, but there is a, they're not an equality, right? States and steps are different concepts. And so what qualifies as a state? Because this is an Erlang conference, I'm going to use uh, one process sending a message to another process that felt appropriate, right? And so if we think about, we, we want to specify how this works, how this transaction works. We have a large candidate pool of states we could represent here. Like we could say like the, the, the system is idle, it's not doing anything. We could say process one is preparing a message, that's a state, it's sending a message, that's a state, the message is sent, that's also a state, now it's awaiting a response perhaps, and then like it's done. Or we could break any of these down into even more like small fine-tuned states. At, we could just literally drive ourselves insane having these questions. How do we know which one of these states are things that should be represented in our model and which ones can be generalized away because they don't matter? And so the advice that I give engineers around this is to think about inputs. If at any point in time during that state an input could come into the system and that would change the next state, like it would branch off, that instead of going to this next state, it would go to a different next state, then you want that particular state to be in your model. You don't want to abstract that away. If there's nothing that would ever come into this system in the preparing message and sending message phase that would change the transition of states, then we can sort of generalize this away. We don't have to highlight both of those states directly. For those of you who are familiar with uh, finite state machines, this type of philosophy about state machines are called Miele models. The alternative is more models, which are like state transition to state transition. But Miele models are like state plus input leads to new state. And it's a very interesting and useful reference point for thinking about like what does your state machine really look like when you're talking about your software behavior. And so like, a lot of this question of like, do inputs change the nature of states is very situational in nature. It depends on like what you're looking at and what you're modeling, right? Because in the sense of a database, if we have a pending query and we have another query coming in to hit the same row, we definitely have a distinct state in the sense that the row is locked. And we might care about that behavior and we might want to express that behavior and capture in our model. Uh, similarly, if we were talking about like microservices communicating with one another, we might be interested in talking about a retry logic, in which case that awaiting state and then inputs in during that awaiting state really matter. It's really significant in what we're able to specify. And so these are some of the general uh, steps that I advise people when we're learning how to model. The first is that we pick one transaction, one requirement. This is very important. We say specifying systems, but no one expects you to specify the entire system in a single specification. Generally, we use do a lot, uh, we do kind of a library of little specifications in key places, key transactions and key requirements, right? So we pick one, we talk about what the components are, software, sensors, hardware, however we want to define that. Um, then we talk about the input to each component. Then we see what steps are involved in that transaction and what controls or fallbacks are in the mix in order to help that transaction go the way we need it to go. And then from that, we want to start asking ourselves some of the following questions. What should be impossible in this transaction? Is, are there things that should, should eventually be true? Are there things that should always be true? And how do we know? Like, how do we know that this should eventually be true? I really like using swim lanes. It's a little bit uh, uh, kind of like, I think most software engineers, the first time they see it, they go, oh, swim lanes, that's like a business management thing. But what I find really useful about using swim lanes in this exercise, of like preparing to write a specification, is that first of all, it helps me figure out where I'm over-specifying or under-specifying, because I can see right away I got a lot of states for something and a lot, not a lot of states for something else. 
helps me keep kind of orderly thinking about it. But also it helps me figure out when I've bitten off more than I can chew for a single specification because I only want there to be like three or four slim lanes and I see some, I put engineers on this and they'll put like eight, nine swim lanes. And when you have a few swim lanes, you can make these nice little, you can draw these nice little paths figuring out like how everything's working. And when you have like eight or nine swim lanes, those little paths start to get like these rat nests. It's like the New York City subway map. It's like all over the place, right? And that's a great signal right off the bat that perhaps this one transaction that we have highlighted is not in fact one transaction and we need to break it down a little bit more so that we can, we can have a, a better scope for what we're trying to do. And so here, you know, I can draw, look, this is the happy path. This is what I think is supposed to happen and the order that's supposed to happen and how all of these, these components uh, transition from state to state and how they affect each other. But then I can also go, hey, can I draw a line from this box to this box? In other words, can the container manager return a record to a container that's not ready yet? And like, no. But how do I know that? Like, why is that an impossible state? What makes that an impossible state? Now I know what I'm specifying, right? Okay, so here's kind of a cheat sheet. There's some low-hanging fruit with verification, things that like we know are verifiable and that like are kind of like the, the easiest place to plug in. The first is like who can talk to what or connect to what. We can do this on basis of identity. Uh, however we formalize identity in our system. We can do this on the basis of policy. We can do it on shared resources. We can also talk about the transition from states, which is what I've been talking about for the last couple of minutes. What is the correct behavior? What is the impossible behavior? What triggers those transitions? And then the one that I didn't really get to at all is the idea of time. We can talk about time deadlines and concurrency issues and things like that. And when you hear people, this is like my newest pet peeve at work, people say real-time system, thinking that, that means like, uh, as soon as it happens, I see it on my video screen. That is not what real-time means. Real-time means that we've formally verified that this process returns at a particular time deadline. So that's what they're, when you hear people talk about real-time systems, that is what they're discussing, the process of verifying that something returns at a certain time deadline. Okay, but we still have the documentation issue here. Once we get comfortable modeling, right? We still have, we write the spec, we do the verification, and then we immediately change the design of the system, right? So are specs actually useful once they're out of date? And how do we keep them up to date? And this is the part that I'm super interested in, this question of like, well, maybe we're applying this technology and these approaches in the wrong place in the software development lifecycle for web development and for distributed systems. Maybe this is not the place we should be applying. But generally when we ask this question, when this comes up in the formal methods community, people go, well obviously the spec needs to generate the code that will solve all of our problems because then the spec can never be out of date, right? You have to update your spec in order to update your code. And this is usually my response to that statement. Because um, like easier said than done, right? <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not against code generation. Code generation is really useful when like, the scope of the problem is pretty well defined. So generating code for interfaces, I've seen be very successful. Same with APIs, I've seen that be very successful. But just as different programming languages have different strengths and weaknesses for different problems, different verification languages have different strengths and weaknesses for different problems. Um, the example that I love giving people is the difference between TLA plus and Alloy. These are both really great formal specification tools. Uh, TLA plus, the TL in TLA plus stands for temporal logic, so no surprise. It's really great at concurrency. It's really great at anything that involves time. Uh, it's not great at doing the sort of representation that something like Alloy does, which really focuses on hierarchical relationships. So Alloy is the thing that you want to use if you're interested in like the security policy of like who gets to access what, and if we have like multiple groups of users and different types of roles, is there any combination of user role that would lead to somebody getting access to something they shouldn't? Something like that is really more suitable for a language like Alloy, because that's the way Alloy thinks about things in terms of relationship and inherent in structures. And then we have cock, which I will stand by is not coke, it's cock. Uh, which is really more about like formal proofs, right? And like that's a whole other kettle of fish, right? So we don't know necessarily which, we don't have a language that's gonna cover all of our potential specification needs. And then real life applications don't just use one language. So even if we 
settled on a verification language that we wanted to compile down to application code, what application code are we compiling down to, right? Are we going C? Are we doing Ruby, Python, JavaScript? Like, what are we doing, all of them? Like, it just becomes a problem that creates more and more smaller problems around it. Nevertheless, many people love to try these sort of things out. And a couple years ago at TLA plus comp, there was this great talk about writing TLA plus specs and then generating Elixir code. So I feel like this would be particularly interested to people in this room. It's on YouTube. I really encourage you to kind of give it a watch because it'll help you understand more about how like, specifically TLA plus specs work and what they look like and how they can be applied to systems. So the other big problem that we have is that formal logic helps us reason about systems. That's why I call this talk formal reasoning rather than formal verification, right? And when we're writing about code, we tend to have to feel very confident that we understand the system already. Like this is not a place where engineers feel like they have problems understanding what the system does. And we typically say to engineers, like, yeah, well, but you'll spend less time debugging. It'll make things go faster for you. We're gonna find all these problems you don't know exist. And it's not that engineers are skeptical of that notion. They're not. It's just that, again, we're not really great at estimating how long something is supposed to take. Like Fred Brooks did, like spent most of his career on this concept that like you'll ask a software engineer to estimate how long it's gonna take something and they're not gonna come in under that time frame and you double that time frame and they're still not gonna come into that time frame. Like we had the 80-20 problem where we cited 80% of the problem super quickly, super efficiently. Then we get to that long tail of edge cases and we just suffer forever, right? And so there is a good argument to be made that by specifying our systems, we help get through that 20% hell that we all have to go through when we're already building a system. But do we really know that? Is that really a compelling message? Like if we don't have an accurate sense of how long it's gonna take us to build a system, then the amount of time that we have to save by specifying a system has to be really extreme. It has to meet that original, it has to be better than that original conception of the system, not better than the reality, because we, we don't really ever have a great sense of the reality in the first place. However, there are definitely places where reasoning about systems is really hard and feels really hard to people. So for example, when we're testing systems, reasoning about what their behavior might be is really hard and feels really hard. When we're triaging them, it feels extra hard because now we've got some manager breathing down our back saying like, why isn't it back online, right? When we're onboarding to systems or transitioning off of them, this is places where like, what is parts of the system behavior are relevant and like, what should you expect are really difficult to understand. When we're pen testing them or when we're talking about scaling them, there are places in the software development cycle where we know we have problems reasoning about systems and we feel it, right? So I'm just gonna talk, I'm gonna end by talking about this one particular part on the list, testing, right? So I spend a lot of time testing systems. I like doing it, but it tends to be very expensive and time consuming to test systems. Like a performance test is not cheap. And it usually has to be scheduled. I'm not a big fan of like automating performance testing. I think that's just like, if you wanna give Amazon like 100,000 more dollars than you might have to, then by all means, like automate your performance testing, right? But otherwise, I want it to be intentional. That means I have to schedule time and sit people down and like do these tests. And any kind of failover test, same thing. Have to alert people that we're doing it, have to schedule time, not gonna be cheap, definitely gonna eat up resources, right? And when we're testing, we tend to do the broad strokes first, and then we go into the specifics and try to see if we can find problems. But how many of us actually get beyond the broad strokes when we're doing testing? Not many engineering orgs as far as I've seen. Like they do the broad strokes and then they go, yep, check, we tested it, it's done. And they miss these big problems that lurk in their system for a really long time. And so one of the, the things that I'm kind of experimenting with with the engineering teams that I work with today is like, what if the first step to testing wasn't standing up a test and doing a general performance test or a general failure test? What if the first test, what if the first stage of testing was writing a specification about what the system was supposed to do under various conditions? And then letting the computer tell us, hey, 
I don't think that makes sense. That seems like there's something here that could potentially go wrong. And like doing a couple rounds of that kind of hypothesis testing with specification before we go and we open up the test and like schedule people's time and resources. What would that look like? Because we can go back to this scenario of like this, this behavior that should be impossible. It should be impossible for us to essentially return a record of a container that isn't ready to be stood up, right? And so how do we know that this is impossible? Right? So we kind of create an order of steps, like what we think is happening. We pull the container from the registry, we stand up a container, we assign it an IP address, we add it to the policy map. That might be the scenario that we're working with here, right? If we're using something like Kubernetes and Cilium, we might not really understand exactly how that works. And in the course of writing this spec, we might go back to our infrastructure team and go, yeah, okay, so does it work this way? And by doing that, we might find out that actually the process for handling the policies and the process for doing the garbage collection on the system of the map that all these policies and stores are, are two separate policies, right? Is that significant? Well, if the map isn't cleared of old entries, then it'll eventually exceed its memory. And we will end up in a situation where we are returning like addresses to things that cannot be accessed by the user. And I use this example because this is exactly what happened to leak code in 2019. Someone accidentally removed the garbage collection process and it didn't clean up the network policy map and everything worked fine until the policy map ran out of memory and then the whole thing kind of went down in flames very quickly, right? So could we have found this problem by testing? By testing alone, probably not, because we probably never would have thought to think about, well, how is this actually working? Right? But could we have found it if we were specifying this system and kind of going into the weeds on it and asking those questions and finding those known, those unknowns? Potentially, right? In fact, I have a friend of mine who does just that and gave a talk at Strange Loop about exactly how it worked tactically, like how you take a system and try to figure out and deduce what problems you might see on it while it's live before, like not before you designed it, but actually while it's operational. And like this is a really interesting talk and he goes into more detail than I would have the time and space in a million years to go into. And so I definitely encourage you guys to kind of look up his talk on YouTube and give it a listen. Okay, so is formal methods for you? Yes, obviously. Like, that's the whole point of the talk. But, no, seriously. So, in certain contexts of software, of engineering, formal methods can offer real guarantees, and that's super valuable. So, hardware, embedded systems, people are trying to convince me of blockchain, I'm not convinced, but let's say blockchain for the time being. We get real guarantees from applying these kind of methods. But, we are dealing with complex and ambiguous systems, and so the real value of formal methods for us in this context isn't really the, the guarantee, it isn't the correctness proof, it's the ability to reason and communicate with each other about what these systems are doing and what their expected behavior is. And so, for something like testing, formal methods can actually like real pro provide value by cutting some of our expenses and cutting some of our time in um, accomplishing the same thing. Cool, that's the conclusion to my formal prepared talks. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and under most social media is under the handle Belmar, and I am in the process of sort of developing out coursework and more study around modeling and reasoning about systems under Bilotti Tech. It's got a tiny, tiny little bit of content, but hopefully a lot more to come. Uh, thank you so much for your time and inviting me to come speak today. Thank you so much. Any questions? And also my B-reel just went off at the most opportune time, so I'm gonna take a quick selfie. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for your talk. If as a web application developer, I wanted to get started with formal methods. Hmm. Where would you recommend for that like zero to one or yeah. zero to 0 0.5? Yeah, uh, I, like, I started with TLA plus. I still have a fondness in my heart for TLA plus, largely because 
uh, Hilla Wayne and some other people in the community have invested so much time and energy to preparing content that's accessible to beginners. A lot of, a lot of the formal verification and, and formal methods community is like applied math people. And so they're like, here, look at all these formulas in our glorious latex taking up a half a page. Isn't this easy? And we're like, no. But like Halal spends a lot of time writing about it from the perspective of software engineer. So I would definitely recommend starting there and getting your, your feeling out like first order logic and how all of that works and like how to think about these systems and then start to move on. Like Alloy also is very good, but like slightly little fewer resources around there. Thank you. And hi, is, is this okay? Okay, yeah. thanks for the talk. Yeah. And I, I teach undergraduate students and uh, by the way, I know Gabriela yeah. She she has just finished her master's degree, and uh, I was there. Uh, yeah. And my question is related to undergraduate students, because mm -hmm. for me it's difficult to just find, at least in my context I, I teach in Brazil, that, oh, let's, let's learn for, formal methods, because 99% of the companies don't use it. Yeah. So... What would be your suggestion for, for someone like me that wants to, or to teach formal methods and, on, and to motivate students to learn formal methods? Yeah, I mean, like, that's a particularly interesting question to ask in an er Erlang conference, right? Because there are many things that we could say, like, 90% of the companies don't do this, so why learn it, right? And I feel the same way about formal methods as I did about learning programming languages in general. Every time I learned a new programming language, I understood something about the languages I already knew deeper and more complete. I didn't really understand object-oriented programming until I learned Clojure. And then I was like, oh, shit, wait, I understand what all this is about now. I've just been parroting it out and doing it automatically, not really understanding it. And I feel very similar about formal methods, like trying to figure out what exactly the, these languages were asking me to do increased my understanding of how computation works in general and how systems work specifically. It took me really, like there's actually a talk that I gave a couple years ago which could be summed up as, holy shit, I just realized that like I've been trying to model improbable or unlikely or like states I don't like and I was supposed to be modeling states that are impossible this whole time, right? And that was like a major thing for me is like the difference between a, a state that is simply unpleasant but should exist because in a context it makes sense and a state that is actually impossible and like what that means to specify systems. So I would say, especially for any, like not just undergrads, but anybody who's in uh, an academic pursuit of computer science, anything new is gonna deepen your knowledge about the discipline as a whole. Uh, I've never been a fan of like, well, I'm gonna do this because I'm gonna get a job out of, out of it, right? Kind of reminds me when I, when I was studying, um, our teacher came in and said, okay, well, um, what we're going to learn in this course is uh, really cool, but, you know, to prove that one A4 piece of paper is, well, one A4, you know, page of code is correct, you need about 10 to 20 A4 pages of you know, formal proof, which <laughs> means it's really cool, but no one uses it in practice, but you need to know it anyhow. Yeah, that's like how, the, that's how they motivate it. The, the formal proof for one plus one equals two is like 300 pages, I think. So. Thank you for the great talk. It was really entertaining. Some of those slides really rang the bell, especially the one that says, oh, let's invent another schema language or <laughs> language and then generate tons of code out of that. Yeah. I'm in that boat. So what to do instead? What do you think? Yeah, I think... I, I kind of feel like the, the pull that we have towards code generation in this context and things like it is really about a lack of trust in each other. Um, one of the, the things I'm really excited and interested about is, is safety science, like how safety is perceived from the perspective of industrial manufacturing. And 
they went through a long period of going, look, if you just specify every single thing that this system can do, and then you take the person and you remove all agency from it and you make them follow the checklist completely, obviously that system will be safe. Well, spoiler alert, that didn't work out for them, right? And what they eventually learned is that the, the context that a system operates in, particularly a, 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 a complex system, will change over time. And that the most powerful thing you have is a human being that can recognize the context has changed and adapt to it. That's something that no machine or no checklist can do. And so they developed, pro they made progress around making these systems safer when they learned to lean into that and like trust people's judgment more. I think. People like this idea of like, we will mathematically verify that this system is correct, and then we remove all agency from these frail computer programmers and all their human error by just auto-generating the code. And I think we're gonna learn, oh, probably over time, as the, the safety community learned, that that is not true, and that actually we need to trust people and their judgment in order to move forward, and we need to structure our tools in a way that they help refine and empower people to exercise that judgment rather than like pulling it away from them and telling them, no, bad programmer, you can't touch the code. We've got a question online. Oh. Yes. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain in more detail the kind of situations where we want to use TLA plus versus Ally versus COP in respect to web dev? Yeah, so I use Ally a lot if I want to reason about the behavior of, say, database and schemas, right? Because what Alloy does is it defines everything in, they don't call them objects, I think they actually call them structures. Some, somebody on the internet is yelling at me right now because I can't remember the proper terminology. But I always think of them as objects because they kind of look that way. And so you have the structure and it has a particular set of characteristics and then that structure can be the parent of another substructure and so on and so forth. And you're defining the relationships between these things. Uh, and so that's really great for anything related to schemas. It's really great for anything related to security policies. It's not really great for the typical uh, concurrency or like a lot of the algorithmic verification. Like TLA plus is much, much better for verifying algorithms are doing steps in a particular order and what happens when they get those steps out of order and do you have any disastrous con consequences from that. So those are the kind of separate use cases of those. Although you can, just as like you can write uh, an application in Java or you can write it in Python, you can write it in Erlang and like certain parts of it are easier or harder depending on what language you choose, you can write specifications for these issues in the, the each other's languages. It's not impossible, it's just harder. Uh, I really enjoyed that. I have a billion questions. I'll try to stick to one. <laughs> um, near the beginning, you had mentioned that all these techniques are very common in embedded hardware, et cetera, but less mm -hmm. common in web. Yeah. And that really resonated. Uh, speaking from experience, the hard part isn't learning like the syntax for Alloy or TLA plus or anything. It's after you go through some tutorials, you realize that all the examples are like two-phase commit or non-blocking queues. Yeah. Do you have yeah. any advice on like concrete things that someone who maybe knows how to use these tools, has gone through Hillel's book, uh, et cetera, and wants to apply it to web dev, like, yeah. what's a good problem for them to tackle in their day job? Yeah, so I'm gonna plug a pet project of mine. I've been working on writing my own model checking language. Uh, this is probably a terrible idea. But the reason why I started it is because um, I uh, like formal verification is really great for algorithms, right? But who the hell writes their own algorithms these days? Right? You, you go online, you have a library, and some brilliant, like a team of brilliant engineers who probably work for like Google or something, have already done all the work for you. And that is the way the vast majority of software engineers work. Like they don't implement their own message queues. They download RabbitMQ and they put it on their system. And so the systems that most engineers are working on, the majority of software engineers are working on don't look like what we need them to, ver what we can verify. They look like what are called um, the dynamic systems, right? They're primarily based on feedback loops with pools of resources and functions that are either increasing those resources or decreasing those resources. There is a style of modeling that communicates in that language, 
It's called Systems Dynamics. It is not, like, it, despite the fact that it was invented by a computer scientist, like J.W. Farser, whose portrait is actually on the wall out there, so he's in this, despite the fact that it was invented by computer scientists, it has never really been taken up as an approach to modeling systems. And so about two years ago in the middle, or maybe three years ago now, and whenever we had lockdown, and I had, like, literally nothing to do with my time, because there were no conferences going on, and that's half my time right there, I was like, fine, I'm going to sit down and try to write a language to build a system dynamic model and then check it. And so I think that those styles of models are very, they bring the, the benefit that we get from the conversation around specification. The missing piece is the ability to now make an assertion about that system's behavior from that model. And I hope at one point, like maybe a year or two from now, to be able to stand up on some glorious stage somewhere and go, I've solved it, go home. Like now everybody use my thing. But we're not just there yet. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's hear it from Marianne.